Welcome to the Heather Pity Podcast. This podcast is about going after the life that you're made for, not just surviving life, but actually thriving. So thanks for joining us. Let's jump in. Welcome, everyone. I have a very special guest with me today, Ken Blanchard. Hi, Ken. <laughs> Good. How you doing? Good. I have been following you, maybe even stalking you for years now as a leadership coach. I grab a lot of your books like Gung Ho and your most recent one, The Simple Truths of Leadership, and just love the simplicity of which you write. And I get to follow you on all your articles. I was just reading one today about psychological safety. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm really excited to have you on my show just to interview you and talk with you a little bit about your years of experience in leadership, but specifically your passion for servant leadership. So thank you for joining. I appreciate you taking the time. It's fun. (laughs) People ask me when I'm going to retire. And I said, I'm not retiring. I'm refiring. And I (laughs) ended up writing a book called Refire, Don't Retire. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah, with Mark Shavitz, who headed up the psych department here at the University of California in San Diego. Oh, that's great. I love it. Is it already out? Yeah, it's been out a few years. Oh, okay. I'll have to check. That's what I haven't caught then. I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> yeah, you need to refire. <laughs> well, I, and I'm going to hold this up for the camera for those of you who are watching it. This is the book, Simple Truths of Leadership by Ken Blanchard and co authored with Randy Conley. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you wrote this book and where it came from. Well, I tell you, uh, Heather, I've been trying to uh, talk about simple truths for a long time. And and uh, but I'll say to people, they'll say, Ken, I love your books. And I said, well, how are you using it? And they'll go, blah, 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 <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so I'm constantly looking at easier ways for people to learn simple truths and to share it with their people. And so Randy Conley is an expert on trust. He's been working with us for 25 years. And we mm. decided that, you know, servant leaders build trust and uh, if you create trust, it's probably coming from a servant leader. So, but we set it up so there's 52, uh, you know, ways to become a servant leader and and build trust, and 26 on servant leadership and all. And what's neat about it is on one side of the page is a simple truth, like the key to developing people is to catch them doing something right, mm-hmm. which is the second secret of the one minute manager. And then on this opposite page, it says first why people aren't doing it. Because I ask people all the time, how do you know whether you're doing a good job? And number one response I get is nobody's yelled at me lately. You know, oh, no news yeah. is good news. Seagull management is still, you know, the w- way of life with a lot of, of leaders. Mm-hmm. And then down at the bottom, it always shares uh, how to turn, uh, how to make common sense, common practice. Mm. And so there's 26 of those on servant leadership and 26 on trust. So a lot of people who have bought the book say, God, this is great because I can share one a week with my people or my family or a lot of people are cha- sharing it with their teenage kids and all because it's very simple stuff, but powerful f- to talk about, really. Well, I just was reading an article today about your the audience that you wrote it to was threefold. Experienced leaders, mm-hmm. also um, newer leaders, and then college age. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I loved that. Tell me a little bit more about the audience. Well, it's uh, I I always try to you know hit things broad along, you know, broad spectrum and all. And Margie and I uh, taught a course on leadership at Cornell, a concentrated weekend course for twenty five years. You know, mm-hmm. on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and and we love college students and all, but we also love new managers. How do you get them off mm-hmm. of the right foot? And what's fun is the veteran managers are saying, now this is it. This is what I've learned and I can share it, you know. So it's just the, so the three audiences is really fun. Oh, I've enjoyed that. I really liked watching how you spoke about that with Randy and how your intentionality to go after those three audiences and the simplicity of it. You know, I'm probably somewhere in the middle there where I'm uh, halfway, my, my, uh, halfway point at my life and I have some experience under my belt, but boy, I have so much more that I want to learn and grow in. And sure, yeah. I I couldn't believe how wonderful it was just to be reminded. Uh, one of the favorite truths that I came across was uh, truth number seven. When people are off track, don't reprimand them, redirect them. That's right. Yeah. 
And that was a change. Uh, we, we wrote the new One Minute Manager, Spencer and I, before he actually passed away a couple of years ago. But uh, initially, the One Minute Manager was a great book, but it still was a little bit top downy, you know, because mm. the manager, you know, set the goals and decided who to praise and, and was the One Minute Reprimand. And so we wanted to write it much more. Nowadays, we look at leadership more as side-by-side leadership rather than top-down. That's what young people want. They don't want your job, but they want to be part of a team, and they don't mm-hmm. want to be told what to do. And so uh, it was it was really a, a, you know, a good way to, to deal uh, with that. Oh, I and, like that. Yeah. And so, uh, but uh, with... Uh, Spencer, so that simple truth is don't reprimand them, redirect them. And uh, But once people are clear on goals, see, there's two parts of servant leadership. A lot of uh, people think it's about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody. But the first part is vision, direction, values, and goals, because people need to know what they're being asked to do and what they're being held accountable for. And that comes from the hierarchy. And it doesn't mean that you don't involve people, but if people aren't clear on their goals and you're the manager, shame on you. But once the goals are clear, now you turn the traditional pyramid upside down and now you work for them. Mm. And that's the servant part of of servant leadership. And so once goals are clear, you want to wander around. And if people are progressing in a goal, give them a a one minute praising, an Mm. add a boy and add a girl, Mm. you know, kind of thing. And if they're not moving as long, you don't uh, beat them up. You say, gee, I noticed in this area, the performance in your numbers aren't moving where we talked about. How uh, how could I help you? Mm. you know, I'd like to get you back on track. Mm-hmm. And that's what redirection's all about. Mm, I'd love that. When you talked about encouraging, I'm sorry, but I couldn't help but think of calling you and getting your outgoing message. <laughs> That was my uh-huh. first exposure to you. Yes. And for my listeners, I have to tell you, if you call Ken Blanchard's phone, and I'm not going to give out your number, Ken, because <laughs> you might get a lot of calls. But if you were ever to call his phone, he has the most encouraging outgoing message. And I remember thinking, I'm just going to call him and listen to his outgoing message when I'm having a hard day, because his outgoing <laughs> message is so encouraging. Like, have a great day. You're doing something right. And I just remember listening to it going, Oh my gosh, I feel amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't well, even talk it, to you. <laughs> it, it's really fun in relation to that our son Scott is now uh, the president of our company. And he said, Dad, when I call you and you're not there, I don't need to hear a keynote. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people do. They say they do call and try hope that I'm not there so they can hear the, the message. Yeah, Ken, my kids don't appreciate all my wisdom either. <laughs> Okay, so you started your book out with your mission statement, and I loved it. It said, the beginning of my mission statement is, I am a loving teacher and an example of simple truths. Loved that. I love that you started the book out with that. But knowing that I was going to interview you, I thought, when you said the beginning of your mission statement, what's your full mission statement? I got so curious there. I could hardly keep reading because I wanted to hear your full mission statement. Well, it's to be a loving teacher, an example of simple truths that helps myself and others to awaken to the presence of God in our lives mm. and to realize that we're here to serve and not to be served. Mm. That's what the, the total is really. Love it. Love it. How long have you had that mission statement? Oh, for quite a, quite a while. I, initially worked on it at a Tony Robbins uh, seminar. I've been a kind of a mentor of Tony since he was about 24, but we've gone to some of his seminars and, and all, and he always pumps you up. But one of the things he always says is you got to know who you are before you can decide how well you're doing in your life, you know, but if you don't have any sense of where you want to go, how do you know if you ever got there? (laughs) Yeah. Love that. Love that. I remember creating my mission statement in my 20s because yeah. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was going. And I'm now 51, but it has carried me out for several decades. And it's to contribute to the well-being of others and help them reach their God-given potential. 
Mm-hmm. super simple, but it kept yeah. me oriented from my twenties into everything I did, whether it was teaching or leading or coaching, whatever yeah. I'm doing, even in my marriage, my personal life, yeah. right. To contribute to the well being of others and help them reach their potential was always well, important. It's uh, interesting because if you could read your mission statement every morning, it'd really be helpful. And then, you know, we, we say, if, if you have a, a vision, there's three parts of it, you know, what is, what is your kind of mission you know, what's your picture of the future, mm-hmm. which is, I ended up writing my own obituary, see, because <laughs> that's my picture of the future. And in fact, I made a tape the other day uh, as a show at my obituary. I said to people, if you're watching this, I'm not here. I am hope I'm, I'm looking down on you with a big smile on my face. But, but uh, it's, uh, that's a really interesting thing to think about. How would you want, you, how would you write your own obituary? And then off of that, what are your values, you know? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, my number one value is I'm a s- spiritual being. Mm-hmm. And then I look at integrity and trust and having fun and things like that in, in terms of my my values. But it's uh, really been helpful to me to periodically. And I try to almost do it every day is to look at, at my mission statement and my obituary and my values and then say, how am I doing? Uh, you know, what's going on today and all, you know, it's very interesting. I think a lot of times people enter their day too quickly, you know, see, we have two cells. We have an external task oriented self that's used to doing jobs and getting things done. And then we have a thoughtful reflective self and the alarm goes off, you know, <laughs> and, you know, why don't we call the alarm the opportunity clock or it's going to be a great day. No, alarm, you know, and so you jump out of bed and you task or yourself and you're running around and you're eating while you're trying to get dressed and, you know, and you're running around. And so I just try to enter my day more slowly, you know, and sort of say, okay, who do I want to be today? What do I got uh, before me? And then it's really nice to, at the end of the day, to kind of say, you know, how have you, uh, how have you done? Mm. You know, what's, uh, what, what, what did you do? What, so I like to keep record of praisings and redirections. Oh, I love that. Praisings (laughs) are, boy, I did that today and I'm proud of myself. Redirections. If I did something that I, (laughs) I I, I wish I hadn't have, then, (laughs) then I, that's a part of a redirection. If you really monitor your praisings and redirections over a period of time, you can really th- look at your life and see what you need to work on. Oh, I love that. So how did you wake up this morning? Well, I woke up this morning just saying, wow, this is going to be an exciting day, you know. <laughs> uh, and because uh, I uh, I had a chance to uh, talk with a uh, gal that works with me on books and all. But uh, we send out all these uh, things on social media. But I like to answer when people send me comments. And so we, we had to, like, I, f- I forget we had one today about, uh, uh, you know, taking care of yourself or something. And we had 185 comments. So we went through and commented about those. That was really kind of fun. And so oh, I love that. I kind, of, I kind of get excited every day. What do, what do I got today? And what do I want to do? And, oh. and uh, so it's a. Uh, it's uh it's fun and uh and then of course this uh pandemic has really been one where we've kind of hung around the house a lot yes yes you mentioned earlier and i have to circle around with it the value of having fun can you share with us a little bit of what you love to do to have fun well i i have fun writing books you know i mean i've written I think 66 or 67 people say, why would you do that? Because it's fun. But I (laughs) I try to not write them long, you know. Uh And um, so writing is fun. Then I leave an inspirational message for everybody in our company every day, although my wife Margie and my son's wife and my daughter are now helping me. So they're doing what I'm only doing two a week rather than five. I get get excited about what what would I want to share with people and and we love to play golf. We're playing golf a couple of times a week. Uh, we have a wonderful executive course nearby. And on Mondays, my wife Margie plays with three women friends of hers. And on Wednesday, I play with three men friends of mine. And then Saturday, we play with a, a couple. And 
we play scramble, which everybody hits and you go to the best shot. We call it hit and giggle. Oh, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, that's my kind that, of golfy. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. And then we love to watch movies and all. We actually went to the theater the other night and we saw the movie Dog. I think oh. you'd really enjoy it if you love really? dogs. I Oh, you I know? do love dogs. Yeah. Yes. It's about a German shepherd, a, a big, big shepherd and a, and a Marine, you know, and he's taking this dog to, to a funeral of the, the guy who was his master over during the war. And oh, all. wow. It's a, it's a really interesting thing, how they learn to love each other, he and the dog. <laughs> oh, gosh, I got it. Yeah, now I have to see that. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, but the simple truth is really fun. And uh, one of my favorites from Randy is that the opposite of trust is not mistrust. It's control. Mm. Because... Mm. When you're talking about trusting somebody else, you're you're letting them run with the ball. You're letting mm-hmm. them, you're delegating some to them and all. Mm-hmm. We always try to make sure that we're not over-delegating. We use our SL2, our situational approach to effective leadership to decide whether somebody's an enthusiastic beginner, disillusioned learner, capable or cautious, or you know, mm-hmm. self-directed achiever and, and all. But but it's uh, really important to that you gradually turn over more responsibility to people and show them that you do trust them. And when they see that you trust them, because that's another one of Randy's favorites is trust begins with who it begins with you as a mm-hmm. leader. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to trust first before they're going to trust you. Love that. You mentioned earlier too, in the book, when you're introducing it, how you begin to realize that when you first started out with working in leadership, you were talking a lot about leadership behavior. Yeah. And then you begin to realize that the paradigm needed to shift to kind of leadership from within. It starts okay. from the inside. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I love that line. Well, we've really decided in our work that uh, effective leadership is an inside out job. Mm-hmm. It starts in your heart with the question, are you here to serve or be served? Mm. You know, and one of the things that you'll get a kick out of, we started a 12-step Egos Anonymous program. You oh, know? I because, do love that. <laughs> but what's the biggest uh, problem of keeping people from serving? It's their mm-hmm. ego. And there's two aspects of ego. One is false pride when you act like you're better than other people and smarter than. The other one is fear of self-doubt, which is also an ego mm-hmm. problem. And the way you overcome false pride is with humility. And we talk about that in the, the book, you know, because people with humility don't think less of themselves They just think about themselves less. And Norman Vincent Peale and I talked about that in a book we wrote together. He was a great Mm. positive thinking guy. We wrote a book called The Power of Ethical Management. But a lot of people give credit to that to C.S. Lewis. And I said, wow, I love to be in in company with C.S. Lewis. He's a pretty pretty good guy. But but, uh, humility is really what we need. Because if you feel comfortable with yourself and you're humble about that, then you're, it's easier for you to reach out to other people. The way you overcome fear of self-doubt is to realize God didn't make any junk. Mm. There's a pearl of goodness in everyone, including yourself. Mm, love that. <laughs> dig, I dig it. She dig for it. You know? <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier, too, about your wife. It sounds like you all have a lot of um, work that you do together. Where do your lives kind of intersect and how do you support one another? Well, when we started our company, which our company is now 42 years old, you know, and wow. it's only f- about 5% of companies that start ever last that long. And uh, we started a company off of working in a relationship with the Young Presidents Organization, YPO. Mm. We came out to California on a one-year sabbatical leave from the University of, of Massachusetts. We were going to go back and I did some sessions for them. And they said, what are you going to do at the end of the year? So we're going back to the university. They said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're going to start your own company. And we said, you got to be kidding. We can't even spell the word entrepreneur. How are we going to start? (laughs) How are we going to start our own company? We can hardly even balance our own checkbook. They said, we'll help you. And we had five presidents, one from San Diego, one from Oregon, one from Illinois, one from Pennsylvania, and one from Mexico City, volunteered to be our advisory board from the Young Presidents Organization. You have to become president of your company before you're 40 years old to be a member and have at least 50 people and 5 million in sales. And they just came and helped us start our company. 
but it was really smart of them and me that when we started, Margie would be president. <laughs> you know, she has a PhD in communication and she's okay. really so much better at that. I'm more, I'm the chief spiritual officer. I'm a cheerleader. You know? <laughs> and so uh, that's really the way we really kind of uh, gone together, you know, is it that uh, when we, we have some, a project and all Margie's usually the one that takes the lead and I cheer everybody on and, uh, we have a family council, you know, with mm. because our son's the president, our daughter heads up marketing. Margie's brother, who was born when she was a freshman at Cornell, he's our CEO. And our son, Scott's yeah. Madeline, is the head of our coaching business. And and uh, so it's uh, it's really kind of fun. But we meet as a family council once a quarter uh, with an outside consultant because Peter Drucker uh, told me years ago, can nothing good happens by accident, put some structure on it. Mm. A lot of family businesses are really, they have problems. They don't talk to each other. Yeah. And people yeah. start to feel badly. Well, how come they're getting more than we are and all that kind of thing. So we didn't want the company to ruin our family and we didn't want our family to ruin our company. Oh, so wow. we've been for 25 years, ever since the kids and Tom, uh, Margie's brother joined us, uh, Met, met once a quarter. Nobody's ever missed a meeting with an outside consultant for a whole day to say, how are we doing? You know, that is and, amazing. And, uh, yeah. That is, I, I've never heard of that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit in shock because as consultants and coaches, I think one of the, uh, when you hear it's family owned, you kind of go, Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's great, but you know, cause you get some people that can't work, you know, maybe you're raising mm -hmm. families and all that. And why shouldn't they be a part of the whole thing, you know? Yeah. Oh, I love uh, it. So it's a. Well, you talk about compelling vision quite a bit throughout your book. I just saw it woven out throughout that along with the um, big idea of servant leadership. So I had to ask, what's the compelling vision you have for your own company? Well, uh, our, our vision is that we want to be, uh, you know, a, a company that really makes a difference for people in their lives. We, we mm. want to, a company that practices simple truths and and uh, and helps people become the best that they can possibly uh, be, and you know, and and so we have that our son and people they all kind of re just rewrote the 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 mission statement and the values and all, and it's really really good stuff, and mm. and uh, so it's a uh, but it's a uh, you really really need it, you know. In the Bible, it says people without vision perish. Mm. You know, and one of the problems in, in our country and in Washington, we don't have an agreed upon vision for this country anymore. We don't even agree on values. If you disagree with some interest group, rather than saying, let's talk, they want to surround your business and put you out of business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got a chance to talk to um, a bunch of the religious right Republicans a, a couple of years ago. And I, I said, you know, Where's your vision? I mean, you're here, you're arguing with your other party. You ought to go and look at the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and come up with a new vision for our country and then go to the Democrats and say, here's our shot at it. What do you think? And then if you'd agreed upon the vision, now you can argue within that. One of the things that we've said, mm -hmm. and we have mentioned in, in the book, Simple Truths, is a river without banks is a large puddle. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yes, so I hear you. You, you, uh -huh. you need banks. You need mm. and, and and the vision is the banks. Mm. Oh, that, I love that. People really need, yeah. Oh wow, that is great. Did they listen to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote for you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so another truth that I read that I wrote down that I absolutely loved. Um, truth number 35. People don't care how much you know until they know. How much you care. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I say, you know, we say servant leadership begins with you, both mm -hmm. with you realizing that you care about them. You want to hear what they have to say and all. Mm -hmm. And uh and the then they're willing to follow, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And uh a lot of people are shouting different things and they think because they're the the leader, if they say something, everybody will do it, not necessarily. You have to turn around and see if anybody's following. <laughs> we say in the book, if nobody's following, you're really out for a walk by yourself, you know, by yourself. <laughs> and, uh, so I think that's a, that's a really important one. 
I love that. You spoke to us a little bit, but I'm going to ask you to expand on it. How do you show people that you care? Well, I think that a uh, couple of uh, skills that are really important is that you try to listen more than you speak mm -hmm. and you ask more than you tell, mm. you know, and uh, you show empathy. Mm. You know, you really want to find out what's what's bothering them and how you can help and and all. In other words, uh, effective leadership is is about we, not me. Mm. And I think if if you focus on that, then you really show people that you care mm. because uh, you care enough to want to listen to them. You want to care enough to to uh, ask them. You care enough to, you know, cheer them on. Mm -hmm. Love that. <clears throat> One of the questions I love asking leaders who have been around for a while mm -hmm. is what has made you stay the course, but particularly in your positivity. And the reason I ask this is because I started out my profession in teaching. And I think we all know teachers that love their teaching job and the other teachers that do not love their teaching job and kind of right. tend to take it out on the kids at times. And I was a young teacher. And I remember thinking, none of us ever signed up for teaching, hating our job. What That's happened right. along the way that made them start really hating their job? And what made these other teachers who were, were retiring after 40, 50 years of teaching and still loving the kids and loving what they do? I, that's well, the secret I, I always like to I think very ask. often what happens is that people get caught up in the bureaucracy, you know? Mm. And I got in trouble when I was a college professor because the first day of class, I always gave out the final examination. And they'd say, what are you doing? I say, I'm confused. They say, acted. I said, I thought we were supposed to teach these kids. You are, but don't give them the questions in the final. And I'd say, not only am I going to give them the questions in the final, what do you think I'm going to do all semester? I'm going to teach them the answers. So when they get to the final exam, they get A. Life's all about getting A. It's not some yeah. stupid normal distribution curve. And I think it's one of the things that people hate about teaching is that they're asked to sort people out rather than help them win. And it's really interesting. Gary Ridge, who's the president of, or headed up WD-40 for the last number of years. He, we have a master's degree program at the University of San Diego. And he was in our first cohort like 22 years ago that we class met, you know, for three day, uh, once a month for, you know, two years. And, and when I talked about sharing the final exam, he said, we got to put that in our organization. Oh, and Gary I and I wrote a book together on what he's done at WD-40 entitled Help People Win at Work. And listen to the subtitle, a business philosophy called Don't Mark My Paper, Help Me Get an A. Oh. And the last time they did it at WD-40, they had a 92% employee engagement score. I mean, you just don't get wow. scores no. like that, you know. But because everybody, you know, thinks you're supposed to do this, you know, why are we doing that in organizations? Why don't you want everybody to win? I always say, how many of you go out and hire losers? You lost some of your worst people last year. Go out and hire some new losers to fill your low slots. Yeah. You don't hire losers. You either hire winners, you steal from other companies or potential winners, you know, and why are you being asked to sort people out? So as you can imagine, I'm not a big normal distribution <laughs> type because I think that's what really gets people down about mm -hmm. being teachers and being managers. and mm -hmm. Oh, I so agree. Again, I would vote for you, kid. <laughs> 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 yeah, we kind of beat the spirit out of our teachers and leaders, and we're they're listening to an expectation that is not even, not only not fair, but doesn't even seem humane. That's right. Yeah. To really set our people up for success. And one of the, you talk about answers to the test. One of the things that I'll ask a lot as a leadership coach is, well, does everybody know what success looks like? That's right. Typically they don't, or they've got yeah. all their own versions of it. So what are we doing? We're running around scared, hoping that we achieve success, but never really knowing if we got it. Yeah. Number one thing I like to tell people, tell them right off the bat, day one, here's what success looks like. And I'm committed to you getting there. Yeah, Everybody right. can relax. <laughs> yeah. And it's really interesting, you know, at WD-40, uh, Gary set it up. So they have a quarterly meeting, every one of them, and they call it the WD-40 tribe. So the tribe leader meets with the tribe member uh, once a quarter. And um, the, the first thing that they, that they do is they talk about, are the goals that we set last quarter still relevant? 
Mm-hmm. Because, you know, like suppose you set goals in the beginning uh, before the pandemic broke out, you wouldn't be dealing with those goals at the end of the year. But a lot of companies, you're, you're still asked to evaluate people on goals you haven't done in, in six months and all. So at WD-40, they can change their goals all the way up to the beginning of the, of the fourth quarter. And then what's also neat is uh, I, I say to people, there's three parts, and we talk about it in Simple Truths, you know, and I'll hold it up too, uh, <laughs> that there's three parts of uh, performance management, performance, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of goal setting, bef- performance planning, day-to-day coaching, and performance evaluation. And we ask people, where do you spend your most time? And off everybody tends to Oh, performance evaluation, because what are they filling out forms on their people? That's stupid. Why are you doing that? Let them fill out the forms. <laughs> so at WD-40, after they agree on the goals where they're still relevant, the, the direct report has a report card. And it says first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, overall performance. And they bring the report card into the meeting. And for each of their goals for that quarter, they give themselves an A, a B, or a C. Oh. There's no Ds or Fs. And the job of the manager is either to agree or disagree. And somebody might rate themselves high and the manager might say, no, I don't think that's quite an A yet. It's a good <laughs> solid B. Let's talk about how we can get it an A. Or somebody might rate themselves down because they're modest. And the manager would say, that's not a C. Boy, that's a, I think you're moving you know, towards a solid B there and all how. And uh, so the whole goal is how do you get people uh, straight A average at the end of the year? Love and it. if if the goals are relevant, because they first, before they set goals, they look at the organizational goals. Mm. And then mm. you set your own goals within the context of the organizational goals and your responsibilities. So this book, initially, I wanted to call, duh. You know? <laughs> I think what, I read that. <laughs> yeah, why is it common sense, common <laughs> practice, you know? Yes. And uh, because I can't understand why we're trying to beat people up and we're not trying, because mm-hmm. I want to tell you, the best companies in, in the country look at their people as their number one customer. Mm-hmm. If you treat your people well, train them, you know, and, and all, they go out of your way to take care of your second most important customer, the people who use your products and services. And then they become raving fans and that takes care of of the profit. A lot of people think the only reason to be in business to make profit, no profit, is the applause you get. That's one of the simple truths you get for creating a motivating environment for your people. So they what? Create, you know, take care of your customers. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yes, I love it. That's a, that's a very important simple truth. Yeah. Well, I think you even mentioned this in the book with Disneyland. It yeah. makes me think of Disney Lab because I just got back there with my kids and we were in a shop just buying um, a little trinket. And it was of the Chewbacca, you know, from Star Wars. Yes. But because their values and the compelling vision for Disneyland is that everyone who works there is a part of the, um, the storyline and the narrative. Yes. So she literally sold me probably three or four more things because we got so into the planet that Chewbacca came from <laughs> and she stayed in character the whole time. And I got so sucked in that I just loved this fantasy world and my kids were there. So we got laughing. So I were like, yes, we'll take one of everything. <laughs> yeah. And the kids loved it too. Yeah. Oh, they did. Yeah, they sure yeah. did. <laughs> and they were serving you well. Well, it's interesting because people ask me who uses the concepts that we mm-hmm. teach. Only the winners. I wrote a book with Colleen Barrett, <laughs> president of Southwest, when Herb stepped down. I've worked with Nordstrom's, oh. you know, Wegmans, the grocery. They were chosen number one company to work for. I've done stuff for them, Disney, you know, oh, wow. uh, and Synovus, you know, uh, is in the financial services. They won the best company to work for so often by fortune that they asked them to stop applying. And they made a all-star list. Jimmy Blanchard was the president, no oh, relative, but I would adopt him in a minute. Oh. <laughs> and uh, but uh, it really is a is a powerful stuff, you know. So that's why I'm saying, duh. Yeah. You know, just look at the best companies, and they're not run by egocentric leaders. Yes. Think all the brains are in their office. Yes. The people who eventually turn that pyramid upside down and work for their people, who eventually what? Take care of the customers. Yes. Well, one of my favorite stories with Southwest was because their value is humor. 
And I guess a flight attendant, have you heard this story? This <laughs> flight attendant was joking about something that maybe if the plane crashed, but, you know, trying to make light of when yeah. they do the introduction to the flight. And a customer on the flight was really upset about it, didn't like it, wrote a really long scathing letter to Southwest. And they replied with one phrase, we will miss you. <laughs> That's right. You know, <laughs> because they, were, they were supporting the, the, the I, value of I, humor. <laughs> I was on a flight in Southwest a while back and had kind of a hard landing and the pilot came on. He said, you're probably wondering what caused that hard landing. It wasn't me. It was asphalt. Oh. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's just that, that great, great kind of stuff. You know, and that that was Herb Kelleher. He was a, he was a hoot. Yeah, and, and that's why they said humor is one of their, uh, their, their key values. You know. Well, I loved it. it. As I, you know, I fly quite a bit, and I definitely just noticed such a contrast between the different airlines. Yeah. Everyone else seemed very serious and stressed, and you got yeah. on Southwest, and you felt like you were kind of joined at a party. That's right. Yeah, it really is fun. <laughs> Well, as we wrap up here, I always like to ask you to leave any kind of encouragement. What would you give our listeners and those who are either been leading for a while, who might be starting out, who might be considering if they're even a leader, what kind of encouragement would you want to give them? Well, the big encouragement I would give them is that to remember, you don't have to have all the brains in the group. Mm -hmm. That one plus one is greater than two. And we say, you know, none of us is as smart as all of us. Mm -hmm. And look at your people as part of your team. And your job is to help that team work together to accomplish their individual goals, as well as department goals and organizational uh, mm -hmm. goals to take care of your people. And then they'll take care of your customers. But it's we rather than me. And one plus one is greater than two. Oh, love it. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for your time today. It's always a pleasure well, just talking well, with you. Great. And I hope people have fun with this little book because it's uh, one that they can share and have fun with their their people because yes. it's not complicated. And I'm going to send one to all my executive team that I'm working with because they're going to love it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you, much, Heather. Take care of yourself. Bless you. You too. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. And please drop a review. It really helps us out wherever you're listening from. And if you want to find out more about your clarity, your confidence, and your courage, go ahead and get my book and you can find it at heatherpenny.com. Cheering you all on. <laughs>